All right, good morning, folks. How was everybody? My name is Jason Moore, and I'm going to teach this class and, um, called Multibody Dynamics. And um, in a minute, if you don't know what exactly that is, I'll try to ex explain some. But uh, looks like we've got maybe more than signing. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. No, that's about right. Um, well, welcome. Um, raise your hand if you're a new grad student. If you just start. Okay, great. Well, welcome to Davis. I hope everybody's enjoying the fine weather and uh, getting settled. Um, how about we take the first uh, few minutes, if you guys could go around the room and tell me your name, and then tell me, um, uh, maybe you can, let's keep it sh pretty short, but maybe say where you, just, where you came from uh, for your bachelor's, and then uh, what research interest you might have. You want to start up here? Uh, my name is Josh. So let me just spend a few minutes um, saying like a little bit about, well, first I'll tell you who I am a little, and then we'll talk about biomechanics. But I'm a Virginian, like I just mentioned. Um, I got my mechanical engineering degree and then worked at NASA for one year and then ended up coming out here, and I got my MS and PhD at Davis. And I also spent a year in the Netherlands. And um, my postdoc was... Uh, doing human motion and control in Cleveland, and I've been here just two years, so I'm starting my third year as uh, faculty. I'm a uh, teaching faculty, so I teach more than I do research. Um, it's a new position that was introduced in, to the College of Engineering two years ago, and we have one in each department right now. So I primarily am doing undergraduate classes, but um, this is my first grad class that I've got, got to teach in the position. I'm excited about it because this is one of my favorite topics. Um, my 
PI, Hub Mont Hubbard, who is an emeritus professor now here at Davis, he is who I learned uh, this from. So 11 years ago, I was sitting right here in your shoes, um, wondering what the heck am I doing? Not, you know, oh, I'm just going to do an MS. I'm not going to do a PhD. I don't know what I want to research. And uh, my project in this class ended up taking me through my sort of most of my career until postdoc when I sort of changed. But so what do I think about? Well, very interested in single track vehicle dynamics and control, in particular bicycles and motorcycles. So I uh, like to um, work on how people balance and control these vehicles. Um, I've, I was in a sports biomechanics lab from, through my PhD work and masters. So I have some experience in that. I'm interested in transportation. I do a lot of appropriate tech too, so I often take students to uh, developing countries and we work on engineering solutions for that. I, I have some, done some, went to Kenya and Cambodia this summer with students and undergrads, so we had a nice time working on some projects there. Um, I do engineering education. Um, I'm also very interested in scientific computing. I think you're going to see that in this class. We're going to do a lot of computing to solve our pro the problems we do. And in particular, I'm uh, heavily involved in the scientific Python community. So I'm um, a, open, a developer of a big piece of software called SimPy, which you guys are going to see today. And, um, and I hang out at the conferences and, and things associated with that. Uh, and I go to bicycle and motorcycle dynamics, dynamic walking, international cycling safety conference, SciPy, PyCon, PyData, et cetera. And so those are the people that I sort of hang out with. And, uh, also, various control conferences too, but um, you'll, you may find out that the, the mechanical engineering conferences are often boring, so you've got to look for some, some good communities to, to join in on, on those. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, what have I done? Modeled a variety of bicycles, how people balance how the human aspect of the bicycle, uh, lower limb walking, um, <clears throat> rowing by mechanics, standing and balancing by mechanics, skateboarding, self-balancing motorcycles, inertial measurement designs, and bicycle transportation energetics. So I'm sort of in the, bio, I'm in the biomechanics realm, and I mix that with human control, uh, usually human, human in a loop systems, uh, whether it's somebody balancing on a surfboard or skis um, or controlling a car, right? That's sort of the realm that I think about and work in. And we have to, so to solve those problems, we have to do a lot of multi-body dynamics. Okay, so what can you do? Um, here's a few simulations. Uh, this is out of Stanford. I got to spend one summer working with these guys. They've got a cool piece of software that does um, human and animal biomechanics. This is um, um, optimal or simulated running based on CMC. Uh, this one right here beside, this is some mo capture that I've done and analyzed um, of a person balancing no-handed on a bicycle. Uh, so this is real data and simulated data, and I usually mix, mix them both to figure out things. Oops, Let's see how these videos work. This uh, spacecraft dynamics is another very popular topic. I think it, I think this video shows, this was a, uh, come on Google. How does this work? This video shows um, the Explorer 1 um, anomaly. They had a, uh, design that basically calls this thing to um, uh, vibrate and then tear itself apart. And I think this shows the vibration eventually. Oh, wait. Maybe not. Maybe I was at the wrong time. Takes a minute. Oh, well. I'm not going to spend too much time on that. Other interesting things in spacecraft, I think somebody mentioned space structures. Like this is a little video showing um, sort of origami principles in, let me get to the fold out. All right, so multi-body dynamics models can help you figure out how to get all these pieces of the puzzle working together and uh, not break things and open properly. I've got uh, robotics. I heard a few people with that. Here's the uh, latest generation of the Atlas from Boston Dynamics. You've probably seen these videos. So <clears throat> these guys have very nice multi-body dynamic models. 
to uh, help them when they're developing all the controls algorithms. And the video on the right, if they, I don't know if they play at the same time they do, this is a, it's not, uh, this is a simulation using a product called uh, Gazebo um, of the first generation Atlas. This is, this is a second generation Atlas, but you know, these two things are connected and, and everything that's going on there is um, um, sort of a foundation of multi-body dynamics and then um, layering on top of uh, different control algorithms to make this work. And making something walk like this is one of the hardest things to do at the moment. So if you want to jump in on research that needs to be tackled, these guys are pretty much the only people that have demonstrated this robustness in walking, um, but they don't publish anything. So nobody knows how they do it. And, uh, and they're sort of a step ahead of the academic community in terms of walking. Uh, so we, we need to expose more on that. So I, I work on some walking control. My postdoc was uh, trying to learn from humans walking to derive control al algorithms that we could put in the robots. Right. Um, sports biomechanics, like I mentioned, I worked with uh, this guy on the left and when I was at Stanford one summer, and um, he did some nice uh, simulations of optimal baseball pitches uh, using OpenSim. And then on the right is uh, sort of more data-driven mocap for doing a long jump. And I think, let me drag it around. Where does he jump? There we go. So I've done a lot of motion capture work, you know, collecting data and trying to either make models that do the same prediction. The screen is horribly dark, huh? Can't really see much. And then, what do we got here? Vehicle dynamics. Um, I'll just play these. This is a fun little um, bicycle robot. And then on the right, a um, car suspension model showing the uh, forces in actuation as you're turning. So working with vehicles. I've done a lot of vehicle work there, too. Um, molecular dynamics. I'm not super familiar, but um, protein folding and molecular dynamics, right? So if you're in the biomed world, there are a lot of interesting things there, too, that um, are still governed by Newton's laws and, and multibody dynamic principles, along with some other biological principles. So um, maybe that gives you a flavor of some of the kind of things that you can do there. And uh, how do I get out? There we go. I also collect a bunch of fun GIFs, and, uh, and we'll probably revisit some of these. But um, for example, this is um, a fun little uh, outer space thing. Oh, no, that's not the one I wanted. <laughs> that, is, that is one. But uh, what I wanted to show was here's maybe a better spacecraft one, the yo-yo satellite stabilization. So when you launch the satellite up and it's spinning like crazy, how do you stop it from spinning if you're in outer space? And notice that this shoots out a yo-yo that sort of um, uh, balances out the momentum and eventually stabilizes the air aircraft there. So this, this kind of stuff, multi-body dynamics. And I wanted to show okay, this. This is a fun little one. Um, this is also outer space. This is in the ISS, but you know why the heck does that thing do that? You know, um, it's not something you you see on the planet Earth, but uh, you spin that bad boy and it has this reversal, right? So can we explain that? And, and yes, we can. Um, Multi-body dynamics can help you with that. Uh, I work. This this is a problem I work on with motorcycles and bicycles called the speed wobble. Um, so we can predict this kind of motion and then figure out ways to make the motorcycle better. So maybe it won't do that, right? And this cuts it off before the crash happens, which typically is what happens when you get in that bad of a speed wobble. Uh, let's see. A few other. I'll show the rattle back. Right, working on car suspension, very popular. So we can analyze all of that suspension mechanisms and try to design a vehicle that can do this. 
Uh, this is another fun one. Here's Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, got a, he's got this thing. It's just a symmetric looking, elliptical looking thing. He spins it. It stops and then reverses. Any idea why that might happen? Has anybody seen that before? It's called the rattleback. It's just a toy. Uh, it's typically used as a toy. There's not much else to do with it, but watch it do this. Um, <clears throat> but for some reason, it reverses. And uh, multi-body dynamics can tell us why. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so there's a lot of weird things, weird motion uh, that we either see and, um, and some that we don't see that we, can, that we can predict. But we can use these models to predict that. See if there's any, any other interesting one that I might want to show. Um, let's call that, that it. So what do you think? Any questions on sort of what, what maybe the possibilities are? Or um, does this sound, is this what you thought it was, it was multibody dynamics might be? Or nobody wants to speak? Talk to me. Grad class. We can, we can chat. What was the most interesting thing? Yeah. Say that again. The yo yo satellite signaling. So, yeah, when you have a satellite in space and you can't touch anything and, and you can't use gravity to your advantage and all these things, like how the heck do you make things move? So, there's all kinds of clever ways to make a spacecraft reorient itself stop spinning, et cetera. And it's also one of the major problems that all, all spacecraft and satellite have to deal with, right? You don't want it to get into some kind of motion that is um, uncontrolled or that you have to use energy to, you know, and a lot of energy to get it back in shape. Uh, you want it to sit up there in a nice stable path around the planet and, and that's it, right? So there's all kinds of fun things from control moment gyros to, uh, uh, these yo-yo spin, spin destabilization and other, other fun stuff. Yeah. All right, so that'll give you a flavor. <clears throat> um, and I hope I don't disappoint you next because we're going to look at mathematics. But uh, let's briefly check out the syllabus too. So I have a course website. Let's see, get the font a little bigger. Is that readable? All right, so I have a course website. <clears throat> um, you guys can read this. I'm not going to go through it in detail. The uh, I'll, I don't have office hours posted yet. I'm going to figure those out today, and I'll I'll let you guys know. But um, classes Mondays and Wednesdays, 10 to 11. We got 21 classes. Uh, I think this quarter, and it's here. It's all going to be videotaped. I guess I didn't have that in the syllabus. So I, I want you to come to class, and we're going to have in-class things to do. But um, you will be able to check the videos, too, if you have to miss one or something. And uh, the course textbook. OK, so we are going to use this textbook. It's called um, Dynamics, Theory, and Applications by Thomas Kane and David Levinson. The, uh, the Explorer Anatomy video that I showed that didn't actually show the vibration um, was a project that David Levinson worked on. Uh, but Thomas Kane, uh, it was a professor at Stanford, and uh, this book was written in 85. It's no longer in print, and the ones that you can find are pretty expensive, but it's um, available for free PDF download right there. Um, so you can get that. And then this one is, we may look at a couple things out of that book too, um, which is another book by them. So we're going. There's a lot of methods to sort of get to the equations of motion that predict a multi-body systems motion, and um, you can get there in a lot of different ways. And one of the ways is uh, what's called Kane's method, and we're going to learn Kane's method here, as opposed to using the Newton Newton method or the Hamiltonian approach, the Lagrange approach. Maybe you've heard some of these names. We'll talk to them, talk about them more. But uh, we'll go through this. Um, Professor Kane has a very nice, uh, clear notation that helps sort out all the complexities that you find in multi-body dynamics. And um, 
and I think a very lucid way to get to what we want, what are the equations of motion of these kind of systems. So download the PDF if you want to get the hard copy, you can too. It's a nice book. We will be uh, using that. You will be going through, um, I'll suggest some homeworks out of there that you guys can work on. So <clears throat> the class, we're going to have two exams, and I'm going to give them both take home. So those will be 30 and 30 percent. So you'll have an individual exam that you have to work on by yourself. Um, you'll be able to use whatever resources besides other people to, to complete those. And then 40% uh, is going to be a project. And we'll get to that project there. Uh, let's see. This, and I'll, get, I'll come back to the software, too. So a few things. Um, We'll ha we have a Canvas web page. Canvas is the new LMS that we're using here, Learning Management System. Um, I'll basically just use it for announcements. And I'll, I'm not even sure I'll use assignments here because I don't need to, uh, I'm not going to collect the homeworks. Your grades will be there for the things. And um, if I have any copyrighted material, I'll post it to, to that. So there's Canvas. Um, I do not like the discussions part, uh, tool in Canvas. It doesn't really uh, allow us to do very good discussions, but I've used this tool, Piazza. You maybe have used it in other classes, and I'd like to use that for this class. Um, Piazza is a sort of a class Q&A website, so I invited all of you to that. You should have getting, gotten an invitation, and I can show you what that looks like. So now I'm in, I'm in the MA223, and the way this thing works is I click up here. I want to ask a question to the entire class, and then maybe it's about other, right? You have to select a folder. Um, so I'll make a test question, and then you can type anything here. But the other nice thing, uh, we will be doing a lot, a lot of some coding in this class, a lot of coding. And you can um, also do code. So if I, I think, click this code block and I type A equals 5, B equals 6, A plus B, right, it'll syntax highlight your code automatically and um, make that relatively easy to read. The other nice thing, which we'll also be using in this class, is mathematics. And if you click, uh, I think if you just do, um, it's either one or two, but let me just try one. And then if I um, do LaTeX notation here, how many people are familiar with LaTeX math notation? A few? Okay, so we're going to learn some of that. So if I, there's sort of a lightweight markup language, like I can do something like square root of five. Let's see if that, how does this work? I forgot how the math works. There it is. So I think, actually, instead of typing it directly there, you type it, you click this button. And it looks like you can click buttons, but you also can just do, you can just type it, which I find to be faster. Uh, right, and see it uh, rendered it right there below there instantly. And then I do insert. And I guess it looks like it's double, it's double quotations. So I guess that's all it does. But then when you save the, when I post it, then it looks like math. All right. So the other key thing here is that when you answer a question, there's two places to answer. And I guess I don't see this because I'm an instructor, but I get to answer, right, in this section. And then you will find us saying this as students answer. And, this, and then you all collaborate on one answer to the question. All right, so we sort of, so if you want to help answer questions that other people have, you can, you know, add your, add your answer there. And feel free to edit the other person's answer. All right, it's not like um, everybody adds an answer. There's just two answers, an instructor answer and a, and a um, student's answer. And I can endorse it, right? So if you answer it correctly, I'll say yes. That's I'll check it to make make sure you feel feel like you got it right. And then um, 
if you answer a lot of the questions, I'm going to take that into account of your grade too, right? So if you do poorly on your exams or whatever, you know, if you're helpful on this, um, that can help raise your grade and help some points, okay? So we, let's use this to ask all questions unless they're a, a private matter. All right, so that's Piazza. And it's worked pretty good in uh, some of my other classes. So um, I think undergraduates are a little less, uh, don't always jump onto it, but um, I, think, I think you guys will. You can, make, uh, you can email me. You can come into my office. You can make appointments. That's all there. Um, I've got a basic schedule here. And um, this is the first time I've taught the class, so this is going to be fluid. We'll see how we go um, through that. And, uh, but I think we'll basically be able to do this. Whether we get through things as fast as I'm guessing is probably the, you know, what I'll mess up on. Uh, the holidays don't affect us, um, any of the classes. And then your, I meant to delete that homework three, but... Project proposal, that's like in a couple weeks, um, will be w one of your first things to turn in, and that you'll turn in on Canvas. And then about it um, halfway through, exam one, and that's the due date, so I'll give it to you the Monday, bef uh, Monday before, 23rd. And then they haven't told me what time the final exam is. I've got to figure that out. I don't know why it's not on the website, but... Uh, on the final exam time, we're going to do project presentations, little well, five-minute five-minute lightning talks. So you'll have to explain to your classmates and me sort of what you figured out there. And then exam two will be due the uh, last week, I think, last week of class there. This, yeah, Monday the 4th is the la beginning of the last week. And then Sunday, you turn in your report, and then after s Sunday, during exam week, we'll have this presentation session. Okay? I'm not going to collect homeworks. Um, I'm teaching two classes right now, and I don't have a TA to help grade, but um, these are suggested problem sets throughout the book. And uh, as we go through, I'll you know, point to these and things. You should do these, all of them, right? F figure out how to do them. If you don't, you're going you're to struggle. So you need to do these, and you need to do them individually. You guys can work together, but you know you need to do these things and understand what what's going on to be successful. And um, and we can discuss these in class and office hours and um, on Piazza, etc. Okay, but it's going to be up to you to do that do that work yourself, right? Do it, doing it yourself is the only way to learn this, this stuff. You can stand up here and listen. I mean, me blabbing at you is not going to stick. You got to do it. Um, software, we're going to show you that today. Um, we're going to use some software. I have a server set up, bicycle at UC Davis Study. You don't have to, uh, you don't have to install anything. It's all installed there, and we'll log in and I'll show you how to use that a little bit later today. Um, you can also install it on your own computer. This is all in Python. So, how many people have used Python? Just a few, four. Python is supposedly one of the easiest languages to learn. Uh, that's why it's becoming the most popular language uh, in the world. And uh, he's laughing. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> if you're familiar with, how many people have used MATLAB? Everybody, good. C, Fortran, one, all right, nice. Um, if you're comfortable with MATLAB, I think you will uh, be able to jump in here reasonably well. I have, uh, did I not put that link there? Under the documentation, there's a NumPy for MATLAB users, and I'll add that. I thought I did add that. That will help uh, some of that transition. But um, we're going to go through it slowly. Every time I introduce a new thing, I'll tell you what, what it is. And um, I think we'll have, it won't be too too bad, but it is a new language. There are a lot of details. You're going to hit a bunch of you know, errors and not know what they are. Um, but uh, this uh, stackoverflow.com will become your best friend, too, and the Piazza site with uh, your fellow students. Uh, but you can ask questions and look at people's answers. 
on this. All right? So, and I guess, um, maybe I guess say one thing, why, why am I doing this in Pat, uh, anybody know why I'm doing this with Python and not MATLAB? Chris? Open source is free, that's one language, uh, one reason. So Python is an open source language, uh, none of this will cost you a dime the rest of your life. Any other ideas? Yeah, I'm, a, I'm actually a Linux user, so. Uh, but it runs on all systems, um, all, all, all operating systems it runs. And that's one of the nice things about uh, Python is that you can do, write one piece of code that runs on all of them. But it is, it's, uh, the, the inventors of it probably were more Linux users than other things. But um, any other ideas? So I said one. One, it's um, one of the easiest languages to learn, and it's expressive. But the cool thing is, is there's this huge community of people that are now doing all their science with Python. And uh, actually, Stack Overflow just uh, posted this thing. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, Stack Overflow Python growth. Oh, yeah, right here. This was posted September 6th, and Stack Overflow is a question and answer site for all, for all programming languages. <clears throat> and the top languages are listed here, C++, PHP, C Sharp, JavaScript, Python. And, we, and this trajectory is like going, going insane compared to the others. And uh, the whole data science communities are picking, picking this up. The, uh, Sort of the new, the machine learning, all of these sort of um, cool new tools are are coming out with Python APIs, so that you can write with them. So, I believe that it's um, um, it is the future, and that uh, the fact that it's sort of open and builds these community, this uh, community, we see this kind of growth, and um, and the trajectory does not look like it's it's you know going to dip anytime soon. So. I've been using it for 10 years now to solve all of my research problems and um, um, and very much prefer it and uh, and so that's reason too right it's just one of my things that I like and I'm a part of this part of this community so I hope you all enjoy it and uh, it will be a benefit to your careers and futures last bit here um, is the project each of you will do an individual project you can pick anything in the world you want uh, that you want to analyze using the tools that we learn in this class. And um, I'll help you choose that. You should come talk to me soon as you start to think about what you might want to do because we, I can help you try to pick a good scope. So it's not going to be too hard to solve or uh, too simple. Okay, So we want to try to get something that's sort of a right scope for the class. So be sure to come and talk with me about that project. But basically, what you're going to do is pick some kind of system that you want to investigate. You're going to write the equations of motion for it. You know, you're going to make the conceptual model, write the equations of motion for it, and then um, simulate that system and see what you can learn from it. And you're going to want to pose some kind of question by this uh, pro project in your project proposal that you want to answer. So, I think I had a couple examples. Uh, Design an antenna deployment system for communication satellite which works in the near orbit Earth and deploys in less than 10 seconds. So that's sort of like a specification you're trying to meet, maybe for a design. Or more of a research question, what are the important parameters which limit the maximum range of achievable throw of a discus and how should it be launched optimally? Right? How do I do an optimal discus, discus throw? So <clears throat> you're going to need to think in the next couple of weeks about what what thing, what moving collection of rigid bodies you might want to analyze and uh, what question you might want to answer about that. And um, come talk to me, right? It's going to be critical to pick a, pick a good scoped project um, so you don't get too frustrated or, it's, you, um, or I give you a low grade because it was too simple, right? So come talk to me. And there's the due dates. Um, and you're going to make a final report, but it's not going to be a PDF. It's going to be what's called a Jupyter Notebook, and that's 
what I'm going to show you in a few minutes. Uh, this part of this software, I could get. I guess I could show you one. Uh, a Jupyter notebook. So here's a here's one for signal processing. Um, people are writing books in this this form, and the special thing about it is that okay, it's text, math, but it also has code embedded into it, and it's interactive. So you guys are going to learn how to do this, and um, the report I'm going to want is going to be of this form. Okay, and this is called a, a Jupyter notebook. Uh, and you can execute that, create the graphs, etc. Um, all right, questions? About anything there? Nothing? All made sense? Everybody knows F equals MA? Yes? Yeah, the piazza. And what what it, what precisely do you want to? Oh yeah, the answers. Can somebody uh, log in and answer this question? Are you guys, anybody there? Raise your hand if you can do that for me. Yeah, answer that question for me, <clears throat> and we'll see that pop up. I say I know the answer to this question. I would type here. The answer is foo. And then I would submit that as the instructor, and you would see that answer. And then, who was your name in the back? Will? I don't know if I remember that. Or Nate? I don't know. I'm going to make up names. Hopefully you have a, a good joke to tell us in this answer. If you submit, so if I refresh, probably the students answer, All right? And I, as the instructor, I could even edit that too for it to help you guys. But you all can hit this edit button too and help out. Who was your name again? Nick. Nick. Help out Nick. So maybe Nick didn't quite have the math right. You can help him. Chris. No. It's one block. It's sort of like editing Wikipedia. Everybody edits the same thing. Yes. So I can say, good answer, and then I can check these statistics, and it tells me like all this stuff like, who had the most good answers, who, wh how many contributions you made, et cetera. And I'll use that information to um, you know, reflect on your grade. I don't have a specific points or anything, but if you contributed a lot I, and you're at a, at a borderline, I'll push you up. All right. Make sense? So one answer from the students, you all edit the same one, which is a little different, but it... Uh, I think it works. Any more questions? Yes. Yes. And what's your name? Josh. Josh. Python three for sure. It's the future. Um, if you know anything about Python, uh, when they changed to three, everybody got mad because it wasn't backwards compatible, <laughs> and it created like this rift. But I think most of it's been worked out now, and uh, we will be working in Python three. All right. You get all kinds of new features, but uh, which we, we may or may not. I use some of them. We'll probably use some of them. Okay. Any more? Chris. I'll show you in a bit. Um, you can always download on your computer and use whatever you want, and then turn in the uh, notebook that you use from your computer. So, I, and I'll make sure, I'll, uh, I'll get the instructions clear on that. I need to add one more bit on installing one piece of software, but uh, you can use whatever you want there. But we have this server that uh, makes it quite easy. You don't have to install anything, and you just 
you can use it. It has a text editor, and it has. Um, I'll show you. I'll show you that in a bit after I introduce more things. Other questions? All right. All right. Ten forty. Hmm. Let's go ahead and do. Did I show you everything I wanted? Semi Pi dissertation. Oh yeah, I missed one thing. So I, the project I chose in this class was the bicycle. I wanted to make a model of the bicycle, and <clears throat> this C file has the equations of the motion of the bicycle. And I didn't know what I was getting into in a class, and I just started it. And I'm going to show you what I got into. There we go, 9,000 lines of code wrapped to 72 characters. Uh, but um, multi-body dynamics models, as soon as you add more than about one extra rigid body, start to do things like this. Um, so we're going to use a computer to help deal with this. Like, you don't want to be doing your, the math by hand. People have done this math by hand, and they're impressed with people, you know, before computers but uh, we don't have to worry about that as much anymore. So we're going to make use of the computer to help us navigate producing something like that. Your equations of motion, depending on your system you pick, may or may not get there. All the examples in the class will be just more human readable. But uh, you might pick a project that, that, has, uh, that ends up like this. <laughs> but anyways, that's um, just to give you a little flavor. And... Let's switch over to this. Why don't, why don't we go ahead and just take a five-minute break, and then I will sort of start the, lec the, pro the proper lecture portion. So it's 1042. Come back at 1047. Scott, are we going to meet Friday uh, or something? I think we should. Uh, you know, I, I was send email this morning, so trying to. All right. Yeah. We, let's. Well, just send me a message. Uh, uh, I, hey, Sanjay. Okay. So that's the. That was our normal uh, meeting time. I have a, it's, it's a clock in, uh, Same time. Okay. Well, let's uh, work that out. Um, if I, when you come back in, I can look at my calendar. Do you want to, you, Friday is preferable. Yeah, anytime on Friday. Uh, so I got two to three, basically, is my only other meeting schedule on Friday so far. Okay. Um, I can do it out of 9 a.m. Is that too early or 5 a.m.? Not this week. Not this week. But uh, uh, could, could yeah. subsequently, subsequent weeks. Uh, I guess next following weeks, I, I would be busy from 9 to 10. Oh, that's right. We don't, and we're we're not sure. 
uh, well, one thing would be to decide if you're going to do anything else on it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, how to close it up, close it off. Yeah. And, that's uh, exactly right. So let let's just meet uh, another time this week, and then we can talk about if you want if I need to meet in the future. Sounds right. How about uh, yeah. eleven? Eleven's fine. All right. All right. So just let's chat eleven Monday. We'll see sort of what the state and what you might want to do or not do, and then uh, what's up? And your name? Say it again. Uh, Michael. Michael. Okay. I'm gonna write. It, I'm gonna try to write them on this thing. You're gonna see them on the screen, and then I'm gonna post them afterwards. Okay. Is that? Yeah. I'm just trying to figure out. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> How many people are going to drop after seeing the intro? <laughs> Nobody omit. <laughs> uh. No, I don't. I'm just curious. <laughs> my my uh, undergraduate vibrations class, I, I we had them do this Python stuff uh, last last year for the first time, and I lost quite a few, I think, after the first day, but. No, absolutely not. I want more people to take it. Hopefully it's a exciting and fun class. For sure. I'll, I'll try to make it that. Um, so I, I'm uh, fortunately got sick on the first day of class, so I don't know if you I'm stuffy, so apologize for for that. And um, if I pass out, please help me back to my office. All right, you guys ready? So I'm going to try to, I've never used this surface thing. I'm going to try to write notes on this and then post them afterwards. And uh, so they'll, they'll be available. I don't have beautiful handwriting, but uh, I'll do my best here. And I'm sure I'm going to make a bunch of mistakes on this device as we go. So let's, uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, intro to things here. And then uh, at the end, I'll give you some intro to the software too. OK? So let me put this full screen. So first of all, um, what are the course objectives? Um, basically, to increase your ability to analyze And that means write and solve equations of motion. We'll use that abbreviation for equations of motion for complex multi-body systems. And there's two um, main formulations that we're, we're basically after. One is called direct dynamics. And that's when you know what F is, and you try to get what the accelerations are with Newton's law, right? So this is Newton's equation. If I know F, how does this move? So if I push, for it, push, push on something, what does it do? And then the other, other direction is indirect or inverse dynamics. And that's when you know the acceleration. Uh, some of those motion capture things that I show, right? We measure the motion, and we might be concerned, well, how much force is in somebody's knee when they do a jump? So we get MA, and then we look for F. So inverse and in, um, direct dynamics and inverse dynamics. And so we'll be able to formulate both of those in this class. 
There's three facets to this solution. Um, the first being the generation of a conceptual model. Right? And this is one of the very hard parts, like looking at a real system and trying to make a simplified mathematical model for that system is no simple task. Right? So that's, and the second step is then um, the use of your principles of mechanics to generate Uh, the differential equations of motion. So the equations of motion are differential equations. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that. Right, F equals MA is that differential equation that we're out after. And then finally, extraction of um, desired information, right? Once you have th this, these equations of motion, then you can see how it changes in time, right? How the uh, model evolves or changes in time. Right, so those are the three steps, and we're going we're gonna to go through all those. The, um, um, and spend maybe, equal, you know, hopefully equally time on thinking about all of those. Um, all of the systems in this class are going to be made up of particles and um, coupled rigid bodies. Particles and coupled rigid bodies. We're not going to deal with any flexible bodies per se in this class, but um, you can get a long ways um, with rigid bodies to describe the motion of things. So no deformable. And just to define what a particle is, the particle is an object with mass, uh, but no dimensions. Or extent. Okay, so it's an infinitesimally small point mass. Okay, and then a rigid body. is um, it also has mass, uh, but also extent. Right? It um, has a distributed mass, right? So a rigid body um, has mass that's spread out in space and, and uh, takes up more than an infinitesimal point and uh, has some specific distribution of how that mass that might be heavier on one side or lighter than the other. All right, so we're going to be working with particles and rigid bodies. And um, fundamentally, we're, we're after Newton's second law. Okay, these Newton's second law are the equations of motion. And if you recall from dynamics, um, the sum of all forces on a system must be equal to the mass times the acceleration. Okay, so this is sort of Newton's portion there. And uh, this describes linear motion. Okay, so if I have a, a particle and I want to see how it moves, these, this equation is going to sort of govern any kind of um, macro scaled motion that we can observe. And this can also be written as um, the partial derivative, I mean, the time derivative of the angular momentum vector, right? 
and then from the rigid body perspective, um, a rigid body can also rotate. A particle can't rotate. So there's a corollary equation for rotational motion. The sum of all moments about a point equals the time derivative of the angular momentum vector. And this is called, um, contribute, this is uh, attributed to Euler. So this is the Newton-Euler formulation of the equations of motion that you've, you've seen in your Dynamics 101 class and uh, which are the most popular and um, way to sort of view those. So you're going to need a mastery of all the concepts above and we're going to get to these two equations um, a little differently than way, the way you got to them in your Dynamics 101 class. We're going to use something called, called Keynes method, okay? All right, and that's what's spelled out in, this, in the book that we'll use. And um, it has a lot of advantages. And, and maybe some disadvantages too, and we'll talk about those as we move forward. Um, but <clears throat> the nicest thing, I mentioned the notation um, is good, but it's also a very systematic way of getting to the equations of motion that leave less, um, less, less room for error, I think. So it's a nice, it's a nice method. And, it, um, and as we move forward, I'll tell you about some of the other, other advantages there. All right, so to do this, though, we still have to work with vectors. All right. So vectors are what we're going to use to describe the location of particles and points in, in 3D space, um, and also um, to describe the magnitude and direction of uh, angular motions, right? So vectors are going to be our core thing. We're going to have to do a lot of vector formulation and vector calculus to ultimately get to those two equations of motion. And I notice I had a bar over top of F, A, M, and H. Right? All of those are vector quantities. So we're going to have to, if you're rusty on your vectors, you're going to have to get up to speed on those. We'll go through them here, though, too. But a um, few things about that. So um, Vectors have three characteristics. I just noticed I can't see uh, what time I'm at. Okay. Three characteristics. Uh, anybody know what those are? What makes a vector a vector? Magnitude. So direction, I'm going to put, I'm going to lump those together. Are there two, what are the two aspects of direction? Basis? Uh, no, that's not exactly what I'm looking for. So there's an orientation, All right? So I, you know, maybe this has an angle theta, uh, but there's also a sense, right? What direction is that pointing? Is it pointing to the left, to the right? So that makes up your direction. So those are the three main char characteristics of vectors: magnitude, orientation, and sense. Uh, the notation that I'll use when I'm writing um, I'll write scalars like so just as a regular variable and then anytime I'm talking about a vector I'll always add a bar to the top All right so we want to be able to tell the difference in scalars who which only have a magnitude uh, and vectors which have magnitude, orientation, and sense. So <coughs> um, a vector is equal if all three of those character um, characteristics are the same. Uh, 
Um, and there's different rules that you might remember too about how to work with vectors. Okay, so there's the product of a scalar and a vector. So if I have vector B can be equal to some scalar times vector A and the uh, orientation and of A and B are the same but the scalar could change the magnitude and the sense of that all right, so we can scalar multiply vectors, um, and that scalar will affect the sense and the, or, and the magnitude. There's also some sp a special vector called a unit vector. And a unit vector has a magnitude equal to 1. So if some vector n has a magnitude equal to 1, Uh, then we can write, I'll typically write in as um, in hat. Okay, so we'll use a hat for, uh, for unit vectors instead of a bar. Um, any vector can be turned into a unit vector by dividing by the vector's magnitude. Right? So if you find the magnitude of the vector, which is a scalar, divide it, then you get a new vector, which is of length 1, but has the same sense and orientation of the other vector. Um, if you remember two vectors, I don't know why I why do that. Come on. All right, we're going to have some lines on the screen. If anybody knows how to work surfaces, tell me, because I don't know what I'm doing. There it goes. Disappeared. Okay, so um, vectors are commutative. So we can add two vectors in any order and we get the same result. A distributive. So if I multiply the sum of two vectors by a scalar, that's going to distribute out like so. Right, that's true. And they're also associative. So A plus B plus C is the same as A plus B plus C. Okay, so you want to probably review some of your vector um, rules, how you work with vectors, etc. Uh, and we'll go over a few more of those in a minute when we jump onto the software. So the next thing I want to talk about are reference frames. So a vector, um, ex you know, exists in space, essentially, and <clears throat> but we need some kind of reference to describe those vectors, right? I need um, to know um, well how. Its, its orientation is relative to what? Okay. And in this case, um, we're going to define reference frames that will help us uh, give that reference or that um, relative item that we can define all these to vectors. So reference frames in this class, we're going to define um, in these terms. So first of all, reference frames and rigid bodies are interchangeable. Okay, so if you have some rigid rigid thing, we could attach a re reference frame to it. Um, it can be considered a reference frame, or vice versa. And a reference frame is uh, essentially a massless rigid body. So every rigid body can serve as a reference frame 
And every reference frame can be a rigid body. And every reference frame can be a rigid body. Right, so they're going to be interchangeable. Uh, one has mass and inertia, and the other one um, is, is massless. Okay, and here's one more key thing. A reference frame is not a coordinate system. And uh, the reason is, is there can be many coordinate systems in a reference frame. Right, so I could just find, I could have a reference frame that's fixed to something, uh, something rigid, and uh, I could have a polar coordinate system, I could have a, a Cartesian coordinate system, a cylindrical coordinate system, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, any coordinate system I want, I'm going to add multiple ones to help describe things in any convenient way I want inside that reference frame. So a reference frame is a conceptual thing that we, um, you know, sort of event out of thin air as this um, um, rigid, immutable reference to do all our measurements from. All right. Any questions here at this point? All right, so there's reference frames. Let's uh, now, I want to ask a question here then. Um, how is a vector a function of a scalar variable? Okay, and this is going to be an important concept. Um, our, vo our vectors are all going to be defined in terms of a reference frame and some scalar va variables. Those are the two, two aspects that we'll use to help define our vectors. And so a vector omega, for example, is a vector function of a scalar variable q. in a reference frame A if when Q changes the omega vector changes when viewed in A. Okay, so omega is a vector function if of scalar variable q if in a reference frame A, in a reference frame A, if when q changes, omega changes when viewed in A. It's a mouthful, and I just goofed it up. But um, the gist here is that um, if I change q, and omega changes when I'm standing and looking at that vector from a specific reference frame, then it, it is a, a function, a vector function. Um, so that's one thing that you're going to have to always ask. If I change Q, does Omega change? And you're going to have to be aware, too, of what reference frame that you are thinking about that in, because um, it is true that in some reference frames, things may not look like they're changing, but standing in another reference frame, it may look like it's changing. And that's, uh, for example, if I'm on a train, right, and I throw a baseball inside the train, towards the back of the train, when it's going this way, at the exact same velocity that the train's going, you standing outside of the train will not see the ball moving. It'll stand still. Okay? And that's one of the properties here. So you have to always be acutely aware of what reference frame you're viewing the motion from. Okay. 
So let's look at a little example here. So I'm going to have a sphere, S, we'll call it, big S, con and it's going to contain a point P. And then I'm going to try to use this cool feature, makes you an automatic circle. Um, so the sphere, call this the sphere S, and then I'm going to add sort of an equ equatorial um, line here, and a center point, and a point P that's going to be on the surface of this sphere. Let me draw this. Okay, so point P, and then we'll call the center point C of this sphere. And let's define uh, some scalar variables and vectors that help locate that point P relative to point C. So we're going to have a vector that goes from, let me get a bigger, C to P, right? And we're going to call that P bar, that's vector P. And <clears throat> my reference frame is going to be so I can use all kinds of colors here. It's pretty slick being able to do this. Um, I'm going to use a variable here, Q1, and this green line I'm going to, I'm going to call a reference. But if I rotate Q1 over, this vector now lies in this um, plane that slices through the sphere, and, and then I'll also rotate up through Q2. So if I started the vector down where the green line is, and then rotate it through Q1 and up through Q2, um, that's going to orient that vector uh, right there towards P, and then the length of this vector um, is the just the radius of the sphere, okay, so the points on the surface of the sphere. So one question here then, I have all the pieces that I want for now, yep. Let's add, uh, let's ask one question. Is P bar a vector function of Q1, Q2, and S? You can answer that. Reference frame S. Chris? Yeah, so the if I change Q1, it's going to change the orientation of that vector. What about if I change Q2? Also, right? Okay, so that, so that is yes. P, P bar is a vector function <coughs> of Q1 and Q2 and S. Okay, um, now let's add a new vector. And let's see if I can get an, another color. This is cool. Um, I'm going to make a vector here. We're going to call that R, R. And it has a magnitude Q3. 
<coughs> and it um, is normal to the equatorial plane. So if I draw a little square there, so R R is normal to the equatorial plane. Six straight up has a magnitude of Q3. So I'll just leave that there. Uh, question two is P bar a function of Q3? P bar a function of Q3 in S? Q3 alone. Not, right? I can change Q3. P is not going to change with, if I'm standing in S uh, looking at those. Uh, question three is Q bar uh, a vector function of Q1, Q2, Q3 in S? Oh. And I haven't drawn Q bar. <laughs> so let's draw Q bar. I'll uh, pick one more color because it's fun. Q bar is the vector that points from the tip of R to the tip of P. So is Q a vector function of Q1, Q2, and Q3 and S? Yes? Yes, it is. So if I adjust any one of those, it's going to change Q, um, the orientation of Q, and even the uh, magnitude of Q, right, could change. Correct? All right. And then four. Um, is R a function? of Q3 and S. Is R a function of Q3? Did I already, already asked you that? Um, why do I have that twice? Is R a function of Q3 and S, but R is an independent of, oh, it's just a statement. It wasn't number four. I was going to write R is a vector function of Q3 and S, but independent of Q1 and Q2 and S, all right? So you can say if a, if a vector isn't a function of a scalar variable, you can say that it's independent. And that's really bad handwriting. All right. Any questions there? Chris. Say that again. Is it possible for a vector frame to be explicit or can a vector have an explicit or implicit dependency on some vector? Yes. Yeah, it can. Um, Going to weigh more? Yeah, so like, like uh, for R, if R happens to be dependent on, say, Q3 and Q2, mm -hmm. or if you change Q3, would Q3's variable weight then determine the endpoint? <clears throat> if, I guess if you had a. Um, I think the only, only way that would happen is if the reference frame was moving at a variable speed, then you could change the weight of uh, how much. Uh, that this sort of variation in speed between re two reference frames would, would, would be, cause this uh, weighting to happen. Yeah, but in general, um, a weighting wouldn't, wouldn't happen except in that case. Okay, okay. other questions? 
Okay, so that's a little basic uh, talking about you know whether what are, how are vector functions um, uh, functions of, how are vectors functions of scalars or not, and and how to think about them with respect to the reference frame that you're viewing them from. So now let's talk about scalar functions. All right. So given, keep hitting this button, given, given a reference frame A and vector V, which is a function of n scalars, Q1, Q2 to Qn in A. We can now define some unit vectors associated with A. So let A1 hat, A2 hat, and A3 hat be a set of non-parallel non-coplanar unit vectors fixed in reference frame A okay so these um, vectors do not change magnitude, orientation, or sense when viewed from A. All right, so we're going to find these spec these vectors that are non-parallel, non-complainer, and do not do not move with respect to the reference frame A. Right, and to restate that, A1, A2, and A3 are constant with respect to A. Right. Okay, if that's true, then there are three unique scalar functions V1, V2, and V3 of the other these scalars Q1 through Qn such that V bar, vector V bar, any given vector, is can be written as such. V1 times A1 hat plus V2 times A2 hat plus V3 times A3 hat. Okay, so any vector can then be expressed as the scalar functions v, v's multiplied by these co non coplanar, non, non parallel uh, unit vectors that are fixed in A. And so this, any given one of these, is called a component. of the vector v bar, right? It's the A1 component, in this case, of vector v bar. And these coefficients, these scalar function coefficients, um, is a, we'll call them a measure number. The measure number of A3 in, measure number of A3 in vector v bar, right? So these are these unit vectors. Each one of them make up a component of v. There's only three needed, and then a measure number three for the for three-dimensional space, and a measure number of a three, um, or a measure number are the scalar function coefficients v one, v two, and v three. 
of that. <clears throat> and this basically says, this says how v bar can be a function of can be a function of the scalar's q. QI in A, and it's only through these measure numbers that that is true. Only through the measure numbers. So back to that beginning. Um, Given a reference from A in a vector V bar, which is a function of n scalars, we can um, show how a vector can be a function of, of scalar functions. Okay, and that we can write them in this in this way that separates this fixed um, set of unit vectors to the potentially varying set of scalars that would would be a function. And that the vi, right, any given vi is some function of q1 to qn. And so the last thing I want to say here with this is that oops, um, if any measure number vi is a function of qj, then the vector v is a function of qj in A. Questions here? So this is the basic notation that we're going to see and write vectors in, right? This <coughs> measure number, unit vector, measure number, unit vector, measure number, unit vector. And that fully describes a um, vector function in the variables q, any number of variables q. Um, with respect to viewing it from the reference frame A, from one given reference frame. Any questions? All right. So, if you got your laptop, open up your laptop. <clears throat> um, and just to remind you, I would like you all, to, I'll, um, I'm not quite sure, I think we'll want to use our laptop some portion of every class. Is it a problem for people to bring a laptop or a tablet or something? Maybe? Yeah, do you have anything? You can even run it on your smartphone, worst case scenario. Um, but uh, ty typing just won't be as nice. So uh, um, we can also pair up um, if you can't bring a laptop. So if you want to pair with your neighbor or something, you guys can trade, trade off some. And that, and that would work fine, too. OK? So. Navigate to bicycle.ucdavis.edu, and I'm going to give you a little crash course on interacting with um, the software that we're going to be using. So how many people have used, um, oh, I think I've already got it open. So I'm, I'm gonna, I'll just do what you do, bicycle.ucdavis.edu. Um, it may say start your server and you got to log in with your UC Davis ID. <coughs> Raise your hand if you can't get logged in and see this a similar looking screen for you there. Yeah, what's up? Have you, you said you hadn't registered, right? You can't log in yet because you haven't registered. Why don't you partner up with Nate? Nate, right in the corner? Nick, sorry. <laughs> Uh, okay, so you should see uh, this screen. The first screen that you see when you log in is sort of a uh, file manager, right? I, you may not have any files there. 
Does anybody see files? Is there a nothing empty? Okay. Yeah. So you can create new files. Why is my screen showing off the side? Huh. That's annoying. All right, well, I will try to drag it over so you can see the whole thing there. Uh, oh, that was correct. All right, I can see it all the way. Okay, so <clears throat> you can create this new button on the right. Well, basically, this is a file system. You have your own um, permanent file space on the server, so if you create something here, it won't disappear, but you should periodically download them probably to your computer in case our, our server has a, has, a, has a nightmare or something. But um, in general, we, we have a backup system, and it'll all be there, but this is the first time I've set this up this summer and running it, so we're bound to hit some, some uh, hiccups. So download your files, too. Uh, but we won't really need any of those other tabs, mostly. Um, just the, you can upload things like from your computer using the upload button, and we can create some new things. I'm going to just show you first. Um, Chris asked about a text file, so if I want to create a new text file, I could create a new text file. It opens a new tab in my browser, right, and I can type, type there, create a file and then uh, save it, and then close that, and I should see that file here, one, untitled one.txt, right? So you can do basic text editing there if you want to just edit right there. Um, another thing is that it has a terminal, so you have full access to the computer here to run commands, right, anything that's sort of available like I can see all the processes running on the computer or whatever. So it has a full Linux terminal if you need to run any kind of things there, um, any commands that sort of don't work in the interface we're normally going to work in. Okay. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Um, but the main thing we're going to work with is this notebook. So notice it says notebook Python 3. We're going to be using Python 3. The notebooks that I show you will work with a variety of languages from uh, R to MATLAB to um, uh, Scala. I don't know. Any kind of language you can imagine, you can run these things now. But we're going to be working with these Python 3 notebooks. If I click, click, click a new notebook, it opens up in a new tab this interface. And um, raise your hands if, if you're not getting this to work on yours, and I'll, and I'll stop. But what this is is sort of an interactive computing environment, and <clears throat> it has a lot of common things that you might be used uh, think about, right? You can create new notebooks, open them. You can copy them, rename, save uh, the notebooks. You can download it as different file types, etc. It'll convert it. And it's based on these uh, cells. So I just put my mouse here, turn green. And I'm going to select right here um, markdown instead of code first. So this markdown basically is a syntax for doing basic text editing. And I can type text here. Right, and then it even has fun things like math. Um, right, I can do this latex type, latex typing again with two things. And if I hit Shift Enter instead of Enter, it executes that cell. And when I typed in text in that that sort of lightweight 
markup language, it converted everything to a nice readable form. And you can even do things, so I can go back to that cell, click it. If I double click it, I'm back into edit mode. And I can do things like, uh, maybe I want an image. Let's go to Wikipedia, find an image. Angela Merkel. Angela Merkel, we'll get her. Um, let me just get the, uh, yeah. So this is the actual image. I'll, this is the syntax for adding an image, right? So I can, I can put all kinds of things. I can put YouTube videos. I can do whatever, whatever you want. You can type math. You can type text. This is how you're going to write your report for the class, right? So you're going to have to add, um, you know, for, use that formatting method, and it's called uh, Markdown. And if you click Help here, there's like you can look up Markdown, and it tells you. Here's some links to tell you like basic, um, basic format, basic for writing and formatting <coughs> of different different things, right? So it's pretty, pretty easy to learn. You know, I can make a list at the bottom there too, and it converts. So this is a very light, um, lightweight markup language that you type. Okay, so that's a markdown cell, a text cell. Um, if you just wanted raw text, you can also select, I think, raw, and then uh, shift enter just makes it plain text too. But the markdown is nice because it's a little prettier and easier to read. Um, the other type, the default co type, is this code code cell, and we can also execute live code right here in the in the in the notebook. So, for example, it's set on code. If I type some Python commands now and shift enter, I just created a variable a1, and it's thinking for some reason. You had a little star there, and when it's done, it'll turn to a number. And then, if I execute a, right, I, I stored one in the variable a. Type A, I get one out. All right, so that's sort of the process. You can execute commands. Um, <clears throat> I can, uh, I don't know, do what do I want to do with Python? The uh, you can print things like right, that's a Python command to print a statement. If I spelled it right, but that's the just you. Um, shift enter to execute these cells, and if it's set on code, it actually runs the code and creates something. Okay, and we're going to see lots of interesting things that it creates in a minute. But let me just show you a few other the features here. Um, you know, there's, you can select any of these cells, and you can copy, cut, and paste. Right. So if I copied that and then pasted it, I get another cell. Um, I can move cells around with these buttons. Right, put them in different order if I want them in a different order. And let's see what else is useful. Split and merge cells. So if you have two lines like A equals 1, B equals 2, and then I put my cursor in here right behind the 1 and say edit, split cell, and it'll break those apart. So there's basic interactions with these cells. Um, if you want to create a new cell, so say I wanted a cell above that, there's the little plus button, adds a new cell. And there are a load of keyboard shortcuts if you're a fan of keyboard shortcuts to do all those commands. So I've memorized a number of those, and I don't have to press the buttons as much anymore running this, this thing. But uh, you can check that out. Another key thing is uh, this kernel menu. And kernel is just a funny name for like, the Python pro process running in the background. Um, sometimes you want to restart that, right? If you you could uh, write some code and it just goes in an infinite loop and you want to stop it, right? So, for example, I could um, come here and say for uh, i in range. And I 
I'll give it a really big number. Print E, and it's going to go and go. It might have already finished, but I can stop that with these kernel interrupt. Okay, so you may need that sometimes. And the other thing is that these cells are not. Um, everything's not going to run in the order that you do it. So, for example, we already know that A, so A is 1. I programmed A as 1. And notice if I come back up here and just edit that, make it 2, and shift enter, and I do a new A, it's now 2. So, the if I ran everything in order, I wouldn't, um, I, would, I would see A1, A1, right, if everything, or A2, A2. But you can change things um, non-sequentially. But in general, you do want your things to be sequential. And if you look at, it has this uh, restart and run all. I use this often. I click that. It sort of resets everything and then runs each cell in, in its sequential order. Okay? And this one, maybe it's not going to stop because it's. Uh, let me just get rid of that. Did, that. did that make sense? I'm not sure if that made sense. I can. Um, if you want to ensure that everything's run in, in the order that you see it on the screen. You want to restart and run all, or go back to the top and execute each one. Because you can go back and edit things beforehand, um, that are earlier, and it will change the state of that variable. And it might not be what you think it is down at the bottom anymore. Is that clear? You'll, you'll, you'll find that out, and we can talk about it. Um, it's a little confusing on that. So I think those are the basics. I didn't, I'm not as far as I wanted to. We only have about seven more minutes. But um, let me just show you a couple of things. We're going to use this package called SymPy. SymPy is a computer-aided algebra system. Okay, I'm a core developer on this project. About 500 people have contributed to it over the past 10 years. And it's equivalent to pro projects like um, Mathematica, Maxima, MooPad, any kind of things where you do symbolic algebras uh, with computers. Anybody used any of those that I just mentioned? Any other kind of symbolic algebra? MathCAD is another. Nobody. Oh, surprise. You have, yeah. Okay. Um, well, let's sh let me just show you what it does here to get you started. Um, my recommended homework for you is this SymPy tutorial and the documentation. Okay, to help you get up to speed on on some of this. So let's go back to here. So one thing in Python is you have to import all the packages. So I'm going to import SymPy and I'm going to give it a short name, SM, um, and we'll I'll explain that later why, why it's nice to do that. And the first thing that I want to do is I can create some symbols. And you guys can follow along with me here. So I have some symbols. And notice that when I look at that, it's a symbol instead of a number. Uh, the, nec the next thing is um, there's a nice feature. Um, if I call this init printing function in the notebook, and then I say use LaTeX equals true. And I'm going to add one more command due to an annoying little bug that was happening last night. I'm going to say pretty print equal equals false. So if I execute that, notice now that the A rendered like math. You can't quite tell it here, but if I do A squared, right, I get a nice, I get mathematics out of this, okay? So A squared, oops. Okay? So we now have symbolic things that we can play with. And uh, SymPy has all kinds of nice functionality, like if I do A minus 2 times uh, B minus 3, I get an expression like that. 
And uh, I'm going to copy the cell and paste it and assign this to a variable called expression. And then I can do fun things like every, first of all, every object in Python um, has different things associated with it. And I hit period tab. Notice that there's all kinds of things. And one here, we have a something we might want to expand, for example. So if I call this as a function, it will expand that mathematics for me, right? Um, I can even uh, do the same thing, expression.expand, but then factor, and it'll sort of do the first and then do the second. So e2 equals expression dot expand, and then we'll show what e2 looks like, and then e2 dot factor, we get it back. Okay, so SymPy has a rich uh, number. I'm not going to get into a lot of them here, but uh, all kinds of mathematical things you want to do from solving system equations to factoring to doing integrals to doing derivatives. Um, we're going to do a lot of derivatives here because we've got to form the acceleration, which is the second derivative of the position. Uh, for example, I can take this expression that I had and I can call diff with respect to A, and it gives me the derivative with respect to A. And so, um, and then if we want to look at an integral, for example, too, I can do sm.integral. Uh, let's do a squared with respect to a. So notice I have a capital I here. If I do sm.integrate a squared that a, it will compute that integral as well as the uncomputed form. If I call the do it method, it will cause that thing to integrate. So you're going to learn some of these in the SymPy tutorial, how some of this stuff works. But you can do mathematics with it. Okay, That's the key thing. And we can programmatically handle this. So as the last two minutes, I'm just going to show you, and we'll, we'll go over this more Monday. Um, SymPy also has this package, which is the main thing that I've been involved in. So I'm going to write from SymPy.physics.mechanics. Um, oh, no, sorry. I want to do import SymPy.physics.mechanics as ME is what I typically do. And then I'm going to create a reference frame, A. We have a reference frame object, Okay, A. And A has some unit vectors with it. And we don't use 1, 2, and 3 by default, but AX, AY, AZ. Okay, and notice that they render these are vectors. The uh, type function in, in Python tells me it's a vector, right? I have a, an embedded deep into this package. I get, I'm, a ve I'm a vector, all right? So that is our unit vectors that we can start to build vector expressions from. So now I can say a, which is a scalar, times a dot x plus b times a dot y plus c times a dot z, and have a look at that. And now I've got a vector much like I just showed you on paper. Okay, um, Vectors have all kinds of things that you can imagine. If I do v dot, Right, I've got different things. Magnitude. There's the magnitude of that vector. Right, so it squares each of the each of the measure numbers and takes the square root of them to give the magnitude of that vector. Is what we expect. I can also normalize it to create a unit vector. Right, so now if I divide each of the measure numbers by the magnitude of that vector, now I have a unit vector in the same sense and orientation as the vector v, right? Um, there's other things, right? I can dot product v dot v, and I get the dot expected dot product, right? The dot product is measure number 1 times the measure number of the other vector, 
da 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 add them all together. You get a scalar. Okay? So we have sort of a, this just gives you a real quick taste, and um, I'd like you to go through just to get a feeling of the SymPy tutorial over the weekend, over the rest of the week and the weekend, um, and we'll, we'll come back to more and learn more about the vector operations, but um, getting a feel of typing and seeing how some of this works um, should be your, your first task, okay? But that is the basic um, tool we're going to use, and it's going to help map closely to how I'm, I'm going to teach on the paper, too. And we're going to use this to do all the heavy lifting of the math because I'm sick. You saw how many cosines I had to write to get the bicycle. I'm sick of writing cosines, and I'm sick of taking derivatives, but we're going we're gonna to let this handle that, right? We'll have to do some derivatives and things by hand to you know, make sure that this is correct, but uh, we want to talk about the dynamics more and not get bogged down in the calculus and, and algebra. So we're going to use this tool to do that. Okay? And then there's a whole other pieces of the puzzle here. Uh, we will um, get to take this through forming the equations of motion, uh, doing the simulation, and then even uh, visualizing the motion of systems that we analyze. All righty. Is that... Uh, no, that clock's not right. Am I right? I'm right on time here, right? Two minutes late. Okay.